Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Science World Online Family Event Series, where we take a closer look at an aspect with our feature exhibition here at Science World, which is currently Arctic Voices. My name is Dana, and I'm the curator of our Arctic Voices Gallery here at Science World. Today, I'm also joined by our behind the scenes technician, Madeline, who will be making sure that this program runs smoothly for us today. And in just a moment's time, I will introduce you to our featured guests today from Parks Canada, joining us from the Southwest Northwest Territories. Before we begin and dive into that though, I would like to take this time to gratefully acknowledge that Science World is located on the unceded and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations in the Senat village site. We would also like to take this time to pay our respects to Indigenous elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, I think it's time that we check in with our featured guests Joining us again all the way from the Southwest Northwest Territories today is Helen Panter. Welcome, Helen. Good Hi. afternoon, everyone. To join us in telling us a little bit more about some Arctic species at risk and Parks Canada's work uh, to and conservation efforts to help out with threatened species of the Arctic. Hello everyone, sorry Dana, I was excited to talk. <laughs> talking to people, my apology, I started talking you before talk you were even done. <laughs> so good evening, afternoon everybody. My name, like Dana said, my name is Ellen Panter and I'm the Public Outreach Officer, Education Officer for the Southwest Northwest Territory Field Unit. It's a big, big name to say that I have four parks that I take care of and I do program just like the one I will do today. Um, I am currently in Fort Smith in the Northwest Territory, so I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional land of Smith Landing First Nation, Salt River First Nation, and the NWT Métis. So today we're going to be talking about a northern endangered species, Arctic species that lives in Wood Buffalo National Park. There's not a lot of them around the world, but they are very important for us here at Wood Buffalo. But you know what? The best person to talk about whooping crane will be my friend, Preble. So hold on a couple of seconds. I'll go get her. I think she's, I can hear, I think she's just coming. Hold on a second. I'll go get Preble. And then she can tell you all about whooping crane. Welcome, Preble. <laughs> I think you have met my friend Ellen. She works at the park and like, this is me, Preble. I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. <sighs> I am, like you say, I am a beautiful whooping crane. And if you look just behind me, look, I'm even on the banner all over the place. And I'm here today to talk to you about my species, about whooping crane. So, Super, super excited to be here with you today. Um, I think Elena has prepared a little PowerPoint or a little bit of pictures to show you. So I'll ask her, Elena, can you put the PowerPoint on? My name is Preble and you can see me on the picture. I was born in Wood Buffalo National Park in 2009. So when you are a beautiful little whooping crane, you are born a little bit like beige. But then as you grow older, this is like we come white. But you know what? I was looking for my sister. Have you seen my sister somewhere? My sister's name is Chloe. Have you seen Chloe? I don't know what happened. We kind of got like separated during our migration and I don't know where she is. I was looking for her all over the place, but I did not see her. Have you seen her? Have you seen Chloe somewhere? No? Okay, she just, she looked just like me. So if you see my sister Chloe, just let her know I'm looking for her, okay? Excellent. So yes, I was born in Wood Buffalo National Park. So this is my mom and dad. 
Uh, their name are Sass and Neuraline. And you know what? We have a little bit of a mystery about our family, where our name come from. They are super cool and I'm super excited about it. Oh, look at us. This is my parents flying at the South Wind flying to the nesting ground. They are beautiful. And you know what? The nesting ground is humongous. It's super large in Wood Buffalo National Park. And we are so lucky to be there and be protected. You know what? This is another picture of me and my sister. Do you recognize her? Do you see her? Now, do you see her? Look how beautiful we are. And you know what? We were the only two siblings that were born, like twins that were born that year. That was amazing. Usually Whooping Green will have two eggs, but they will only, most of the time, only one of them will survive. But lucky for us in my family, my sister and I, we both made it. And now we're beautiful whooping crane. And you know what? On that picture, we were about like two, two, three months old. We we're not really big. Now we're about two, two years old. So we're a little bit bigger. So you haven't seen her? No? Okay. Keep an eye open. If you see her through the day or tomorrow, tell her I'm looking for her, okay? Oh, yes, I'm Preble. This is me in case you forgot. So my sister's name is Chloe, and we were born in Wood Buffalo National Park. <sighs> but let's talk a little bit about Wood Buffalo. And a lot of people don't really know a lot. I've heard at this Whooping Cream School that Wood Buffalo is the largest national park in Canada. Can you imagine? I'm super excited. I've heard too that they have the largest land mammal, the big bison. I saw them roaming around at the salt plains. They're huge. Also, they have a humongous beaver dam. Oh, can you imagine? And the largest nesting ground of the whooping crane. And did you know that maybe I, do, I don't look too tall, but the whooping crane are the tallest bird in North America. Super cool, isn't it? I'm so happy. I'm not the tallest of my family though my dad is pretty tall but I think most of the whooping crane can be like five feet tall and then when we open our wings it's about six feet I mean mine my little wings are pretty short and I'm the shortest but I hope if I eat a little food I'll be able to grow big and strong just like my mom and dad <sighs> There's so many things to see in Wood Buffalo. And even though I'm not really here in the winter because I don't like the cold, I like going to Aransas in Texas where it's warm and I can eat blue crab and I feast on the beach. I've heard there's beautiful northern lights in the winter when it gets dark. Maybe at the end of this month or beginning of September, just before we leave for our migration, maybe I'll be able to see them. I've never seen them before. My mom said they are beautiful and sometimes different colors. So I hope in the nesting ground when I go to bed at night, I'll be able to see some of them. I'm super excited. Um, Preble. Preble is kind of a different name. And I was telling my mom and dad, I was like, what does Preble mean? Well, you know what? Our nest is close to those little rivers. There's little rivers and creek beside our nest, close by. And Preble is one of the little creek that is just beside our nest. So that's where my name come from. Same for my sister, Chloe. There's a little creek flowing by our nest. The name is, the creek is Chloe. And same for my mom and dad. That name is Sass and New Orleans. So those are some of the little stream, little creek river that are flowing close to our nesting ground or in our nesting ground. I have other friends that were born with me or uncle and auntie where their name come from other place around the park. So I found that pretty exciting. And there's different way to know their name or to recognize them. And I'll show you a couple um, other examples a little bit later, but I really like my name Preble. I find it really exotic, really nice. And I found that 
New Orleans, Chloe, and Sass are pretty nice names. So I'm super excited to have that name. You know what? In our nesting ground, like there's a lot of puddles. That's where I eat all the time. I really like eating a lot. Oh, my belly gets full all the time. And there's a lot of little puddles. And I've heard humans saying, they look like pancakes. Pancakes with maple syrup. I don't know what pancakes are, neither what maple syrups are, but sounds pretty good to me. <sighs> For me, they look like big puddles and I found a lot of food in the nesting ground. So I eat, hmm, what do I eat? Leeches, yum. I eat a uh, small bug, mosquitoes, and I eat frogs, so delicious. When I go to Aranzas though, I eat blue crab. This is the delicacy, they're so good, but frogs are not bad too. So there's a lot of food that can be found in a nesting ground. And also because those puddles, there's kind of a little bit of water and the rest is mud. We don't have a lot of other animal coming to bother us or eating our food other than ravens. Ravens are not the nicest. They sometimes come and try to steal the eggs in the nest, which is not good, right? We want to have more whooping cranes. So, I'm like, shoo, 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 Raven, go away. My friend and I, we, we were always looking for Ravens and chasing them away to make sure they're not bothering the other parents that are trying to have or to make a family, right? But you know what? Our nesting ground is quite big and there's a lot of land, a little bit of land and a lot of puddles, but you know what? Look at me, I'll white and pretty I am. You know what? I spend a lot of time cleaning myself. I can spend like 10 hours a day just making my feathers so beautifully white because you know what? You want to be pretty even in the wilderness and you want to make sure that soon I'll have to find a boyfriend and I want to make sure that my boyfriend think I'm super pretty and my feathers are beautifully white, super important. I don't want to be all muddy. But then some days I like to go and those pancake, they call it, and go walk on the mud and find some food. And sometimes I leave footprint for the others to find them or to find me when we play hide and seek. Super cool. But you know what? We don't spend all our, we spend our summer in Wood Buffalo, but then after that, we gotta go south. So long, long journey down to Texas and Arenzas and Texas. Some people, I mean, some whooping crane are really strong and they can fly like 4,000 kilometers in 14 days. Can you imagine? Not me. I like to stop everywhere. I like to look where I'm going. I like the landscape. I like to eat along the way. So I take my time. I may take a month or so with my family and we're just hanging out. But some, they just want to go and go fast. But can you imagine? After you're born in June, you by September, you start your migration. You're just like three months old when you start and go to Texas, 4,000 kilometers. I was only three months old, super young. I needed to eat a lot. This is why I still like to eat a lot so I can follow all my friends that are pretty strong and faster than me a little bit. You know what? We didn't have a lot of whooping cream. I heard that I learned that at the whooping crane school where there was only about only 14 birds in the entire world around 1923. That's not a lot. And you know what? Only three of them were women, were moms, only three ladies. That's not a lot, right? <sighs> it was a long, it took a long time for the recovery of the whooping crane because you know what? Three mamas per year, that doesn't make a lot of babies. We need a lot of, we need a little girl just like me to make a lot of babies so we can have a lot of friends to play with, right? But you know what? 
about a hundred years later, that's when I was about to be born. And there's about 500 in the entire world. That is amazing. There's so much conservation and effort that's been done. I've heard that some people play a really good role into the conservation of the whooping crane. And one guy, they were telling me at the whooping crane school, his name is, oh, that thing flies, kite, Ernie Kite. Sounds like it, right? Ernie Kite and this guy went in the nesting ground to grab an egg. But you're like, well, if we want to have more whooping crane, we got to leave the egg there. But you know what? Usually whooping crane always have two eggs, but sometimes only one whooping crane will survive. Except in my family, of course, because my sister, Chloe, like we were buddy buddies, so we stayed together. Have you seen? No, I haven't seen her yet. Okay, let me know if you see her, okay? So we know they always have two eggs, but sometimes Raven will come and get an egg or whooping crane or friends will not find enough food to be able to survive. So this guy, Ernie, was like, if I go in the nesting ground, maybe I can grab an egg and keep it in captivity. And then we can repopulate the whooping crane. And you know what? It did work. It did. That was amazing. But you know what? Before Ernie came in many, many years ago in 1943, I believe, they didn't know where the whooping crane were nesting. Like my ancestors were kind of hiding. They knew whooping crane will go in Northern Canada, but they didn't know where. So one day there was a big forest fire in the north part of the park. And then one bush pilot was bringing some crew and the biologist to um, close to the fire and saw two little white dots on the ground, just like my friend here, two little white dots on the ground. Then it's like, oh, it's June. It cannot be snow. So they went close and they found two whooping crane. That's how they discovered where we were nesting. Isn't that amazing? That's a good thing because now they can protect even more where we are. And then there's other people and other animals that play a beautiful role in my survival and the that I can make it here today to talk to you. And one is my great, 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 great grandpa. I think I forgot one great, great. Grandpa Canis for Canada, USA. Canis was in the nesting ground one day, but we're not too sure what happened to him. He had a broken wing. He could not fly. Canis could not fly south and do the migration. So the biologist decided to bring Canis in captivity to fix his wing, but still Canis could not, could not um, fly. So they're like, well, maybe we can keep Candace in captivity and then we can find him some girlfriends and maybe they will have families. So they found a girlfriend for Candace and Candace was able to have many, 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 many babies over the course of his year, uh, course of his life. I think descendants of Candace, there's about 150 babies. <gasps> That is amazing. Thank you, Canis. I'm here today because of Canis, right? So this is amazing. I'm sad that Canis couldn't fly away like the others, but if I'm here today, it's because of Canis. He's my great, 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 great grandpa. Other biologists like this, like, um, what's his name? Brian. Brian Jones help find and conserve the whooping crane just like me. And you know what? He was doing a lot of recording because they want to know how we communicate to each other. We have our special way of communicating You're using our little whoop, whoop. And then he wanted to know how we mate, how we find a boyfriend or a girlfriend. That's pretty cool. And you know what? I'll share 
with you a little bit of information later about how we find a boyfriend and a girlfriend. I have seen around hmm, cousins and uncles that have a different braid, like like um a kind of a bracelet around their leg. And I don't know if you could see it. I have one too. Right here, I have an old version of a bracelet that is on my leg because they cut me about two years ago. Let's see if I can fly higher to show you. This is the older one. And you know what? This is made for us to hmm, identify ourselves. And you know what? It's called a, what are the letters? J, G, G, P, G, P, S. Oh yeah, that's right, G, P, S. And they send signal to the satellite that help the people that are doing our conservation and recovery to know where we are going. So when we look at, when they look at the data, I don't know what data is, but when they look at numbers, I think, or location, they know where we are going and they can keep an eye on us. Everybody, almost all the whooping green, have one and they have different color band too. So I don't have, I just have one. I have the old GPS unit nowadays like i got cut last year so this year they have new one that are not as heavy they're prettier to you on your legs and they work a little bit better so when they come to check us out they use those big machines and you know that's a little bit scary but it seems like they are keeping an eye on us and making sure that we always stay healthy and you know what often they will hmm, come and catch us and that's how they put the gps on us they will come and catch us and see if we're healthy when when they catch us they have first of all they have to find us and you know my friend and i we like to hide a little bit and we like to make sure that they will not find us so I want to test you eyes to see if you will be able to see us somewhere in those pictures. So if you look, hmm, can you see us? If you were in the helicopter, that will be your view. Do you think you could see us? Do you see us? We're hiding. Do you see? Huh, what about now? Hmm, there's five of us. My sister Chloe, you haven't seen her yet? No? Uh, my sister Chloe and my two cousins, Cherry and Carlson and Sweetgrass, those are my cousin. We're hiding. Well, not really hiding, but we're somewhere in this picture, do you think? You can spot us, can you see us? Mmm, do you have good eyes? Often the people in the helicopter I've heard are using, not cameras, but binoculars to be able to spot us. Oh, do you now, do you see us? Yes, good work, and there we are just over here beautiful white bird and you know what that that was the view of the person that um came in for the forest fire and found us it just was like flying at the right place at the right moment to be able to find two little white dots on the sea of green it's humongous and you know what when they come with their big helicopter and we can hear them coming and we're like oh, oh who's gonna be be caught so they catch about 10 birds per time and then we know and we like to make them run we know that when they land they have about 12 minutes 12 minutes to catch you because after that it's too hard on oh we think it's too hard on them to run around but they say it's too hard on us I think it's maybe both. So they have about 12 minutes to catch us. And then, so there's always three people. And then when they catch you, they try to corner you or they try to go places where they can catch you easily. And sometimes we like to go in the water. So they have to sink to do the mud and they don't look very happy about it. But we do because you know what? We're not that heavy. We're about 10 to 15 pounds. So 
we can walk on water almost. And then when they catch us, so they will wait us. Um, I had a lot of frogs, leeches, and little bugs that day. So my weight was probably big because I had a lot of food, but they will wait you. They will get a little bit of your blood too to make sure you're healthy and to analyze your DNA. And they will also put a GPS tracker on your leg and they will make you have a little color band. So that's the way they will track you. And then when we go to Texas, then they can see which color band you are. So they know which crane has made did through the 4,000 kilometers migration. Oh, that's so, that's super important that they are taking care of us, right? That's how we went from 14 birds to now 500. Oh, I have a lot of friends. And because there's about a lot of nests this year, I heard this almost like 100 nests. That's a lot of nests. I'm going to have a lot of friends and cousins to play with this year. <sighs> they have new ways. My GPS tracker is old and uh, I almost lost it. It kind of fell apart. The new GPS they are using is way better, way lighter nowadays. And you know what? I'm not worried about losing it. See, it's easy. I just took it off. It kind of fell apart a little bit and I just had to pick on it and then it fell apart. But this one is big, way too big for me. So, but I just kept it on because I know if I lose it, they might think I'm not gonna make it or they will come and look for me. I hope, I hope my sister didn't lose hers and they will find her soon. <sighs> this is my cousin Carlson. He's He's pretty handsome, isn't he? And look, he has some color, been different color than me. Well, I don't have color, but he does. He is the yellow and blue. Usually I notice that all my friends, they have like either yellow or blue or black or white or red, five colors, that's it. And each people, each bird will have a different color. This is when they, they cut my friend Carlson, my cousin, uh, excuse me. And I'll let you watch the video of them after they've done all their testing. This is my parents and my and me, in case you forgot how cute I was when I was little. But you know what? My cousin, when they caught him here at the end, he was going to say, oh, thank you. Thank you for taking care of me. But I think they thought he was a little bit scared, I think. I'm not sure. But you know what? We like to make them run and make them look at us and catch us. And, you know, sometimes they will catch us easily and sometimes it will take a little bit longer, but you know what? We have fun making them run a little bit. Yeah, my parents, they're cute. I love it. Some other pictures of my nesting ground and my friend and my family. Oh, the dance. That's right. The dance. Oh. The dance. You know what? When you're about two years old or even three most of the time, your mom and dad will tell you that, well, you're gonna have to learn how to dance because you're gonna need to find a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Ooh. That means I gotta look at boys and I gotta find a boyfriend soon. And maybe next year I'll be a mom, I don't know. But you know what? At the school, they taught us how to be very elegant how to do our dance and they taught us that it's super important to to dance and to learn how to dance so i want to share this dance with you so you can stand up in your living room and you can 
just enjoy the dance with me, feel free to stand up and I will just go a little bit higher so you can see me better dancing away. Okay, so they were telling me that it's all about being elegant, right? Being very elegant. So they were telling me that we have to be elegant. So if we look, if you look at my wings, they are all white with black tip. So when we do our elegant or neutral dance, most of the time it's gonna be the boy that will try to impress the girl, but hmm, I wanna learn the dance too. So instead of just doing whatever he's doing, I wanna learn it too. So I can show you how. So you gotta spread your wings, six feet tall of wings and the tip, will go in and out and in and out and in and out and as you do so then you use your wings so you go in fingers out in fingers out and you can bob your head a little bit as you do it in and out and then gonna have to go a little bit higher to show you you gotta wiggle your bum too wiggle your feathers wiggle your feathers wiggle your feathers so as you do it you wiggle your feathers and then you go in and out and in and out and you know what we're called whooping cranes because we whoop so as you do it you whoop too a little bit whoop try to impress me whoop and whoop, and wiggle your bum, wiggle your feathers, woo! And that is the dance that I learned to impress my future boyfriend. And I hope he's gonna do it a little bit better than me. I'll practice. But then when it's time to make the boyfriend or the guy, we'll do that and I will mimic, I will do the same as he does so thank you very much ah, and you know what it's time for me to go eat a little bit i'm hungry i'm gonna go eat a couple frogs so all that dancing made you so happy i know <laughs> before you go we want to say a big thank you to you and uh let helen know that we thank her too for you joining us today we hope to see you next time bye for today